All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome back. Um, I am glad to be back after a two-week um, absence. I was in Italy. Uh, I was just talking to Shrikan about my trip to Italy. Uh, it was an amazing time. Uh, spent some time in Rome, and then I wanted, what I really wanted to do is to, to visit Florence uh, because of our connection with Dante, and you know, we did that year-long journey going through the uh, Levita Nova and the Divine Comedy. And of course, before that, I spent another three years with another group going through Dante. So after all this time, you almost feel like you, you get to know him on a personal level. So it was very meaningful to go to Florence and see uh, the house where he was born, to see where Beatrice was born and lived, and all those places are still there. It's amazing to realize how close they are. That, that's, I guess, my shocking discovery was that they were literally neighbors. Uh, it, it's, it, it would be amazing if they didn't know each other because they were literally like a, on a uh, adjoining street. Um, so anyway, that was something that I really enjoyed and maybe uh, we'll talk some more at another meetup about. But this time we want to uh, talk about uh, Don Carlos uh, by Schiller, which uh, in some ways continues our previous um, discussion uh, of Le Cid, because we're still on the Spanish theme here and uh, progressing uh, slowly with that. And it's interesting, it's another historical uh, play based on a historical um, persona, as opposed to, let's say, something like Otello or some of the earlier plays we looked at. And I want to, because of that, I want to spend a little bit of time uh, uh, just talking about the context, because in this particular case, Unlike Le Cid, we do have a bit of a divergence between uh, the characters that we, we read about in Schiller um, versus their historical um, prototypes. So I wanted to paint a little bit of a picture and maybe discuss a little bit of that before we dive into the play itself. So with that said, I um, want to show a couple of portraits that I was able to find on, on the, the web the interwebs. So let me share my screen real quick and show a couple of pictures. Let's see. Um, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Great. Okay. So uh, this is the Princess of Eboli. Um, uh, which is very, uh, you'll notice she has an eye patch, um, which uh, it was historically she, uh, she lost an eye, but still she was uh, considered a very beautiful woman, despite that. And she was, um, in reality, uh, quite an um, intrigue uh, weaving person at the court. So this part uh, of the depiction actually is uh, historically accurate. Uh, she was married to uh, uh, Rida Gomez, um, the person that in the play she is uh, betrothed to and, try, and is trying to escape that marriage. She actually seemed to me ha had a pretty happy uh, go at it. She had 10 children, um, four of which did not survive um, the young age, but she was uh, apparently pretty good at uh, home life. Uh, but after her husband's death, she was um, she went to uh, away to the abbey and then came back to the court. And apparently at that time, uh, there were some possible intrigues going on. And also she was fabled to, to have been a paramour of uh, King, Phil, um, King Philip II. So there was a chance that she actually did have an affair with Philip II of Spain. Um, with that, here's one uh, rendition of, of him. Let me just uh, do this so it's easier for you guys to see. So here is a rendition of uh, Philip, quite a uh, masculine-looking king, uh, a warrior. Um, at the time of, of uh, the play, Philip was about 40 years old. So he's presented as an older man, as like a 60-year-old man, but he wasn't actually that old. He was around 41 uh, at the time of, uh, of the play, which was, I think, roughly 1562. Uh, so this this is Philip, um, and then this is uh, Duke of Alba, uh, another uh, protagonist in the play who is um, a close ally of the king and, and um, the military commander that is sent to to Netherlands to oversee um, the Flemish provinces. So he is 
um, probably was a very distinguished man, uh, despite uh, the portrayal that Schiller paints with uh, him being kind of cowardly and uh, sort of uh, given to intrigues and all these under the table dealings and so on. He probably was, a, uh, in reality, he was a very distinguished uh, person. You can probably tell from the portrait that he's not the man you want to cross. Uh, and then we have Don Carlos. Now, Don Carlos, uh, in reality, was not much like the uh, person that we meet in, in the play at all. So he, from the early age, suffered from uh, physical um, deformities. Uh, he had um, mental issues even early on, and then he had several incidents where he fell from the stairs and uh, he had to have some sort of like uh, uh, sur surgery in his head. I mean, it, it, the guy really had a very tough um, go at it. And, um, but the result of it was he was very mentally unstable, uh, very um, sadistic, even in his early childhood. Uh, there are stories about him killing animals and um, flogging people for no reason. And then just, just really atrocious <laughs> individual, a womanizer at that. And, uh, just um, you know, quite different person than we that we see in in Schiller's play. Uh, regardless, though, um, a lot of the events that are described are historically accurate. Uh, so, so things like his um, you know the main uh, part of the plot, which is he was betrothed to Elizabeth of Valois, but then something uh, the plans have changed, and his father actually married her, and so instead of him. And this is, of course, the um, you know the the crux of the plot around which everything else revolves in the play. So this part was accurate. Um, and then uh, the decision to name Alba, Duke of Alba, as the uh, uh, the overseer of those Flemish provinces, that also was accurate and uh, obviously was a big um, issue for him. So he hated Alba, and he actually tried to conspire. Uh, with um, oh, oh, with aristocrats in in the Netherlands to to try to overthrow um, Spanish rule there. So all of that is the kind of the um, the foundation of the story. So that was all accurate. But the but the portrayal of characters uh, definitely uh, diverges from from historical reality quite a bit here. Uh, so this was him. And then this is uh, the actual happy union of Philip II and uh, Elizabeth of Valois. And there's the portrait of, of Elizabeth right here. Um, so I, I just thought maybe it would be good to, to do this uh, overview, a little tour of the portraits, because it does give us a sense of that era and uh, kind of sets the tone for, for the discussion. So with that, I'm going to go back to... Um, our discussion. And uh, I mean, I have a lot of notes. Uh, and I'll guess I can, I'll, I'll get to them as we as we talk some more and get into the details. But really, um, the big themes for me that came to the forefront as, as, I, as I read and I thought about this, is that we have two, um, two main thrusts in this, right? We have the personal account of the, the love dilemmas Right, we have uh, various love triangles going on, and that's one aspect of this. But the other aspect, which is somewhat different, and we, I don't think we've seen this before, is the um, political aspect, not personal at all. And this is the uh, what's, what, make, what makes Schiller an interesting playwright uh, or novel playwright. And I think he kind of shocked people when he started, uh, you know, involving more politics in his play and not just personal personal issues like Shakespeare. Shakespeare is, mo I mean, he, he uses politics as a stage for, for personal uh, ups and downs and so on. But the, uh, which Schiller does is he kind of sets it side by side and he actually um, juxtaposes these two uh, currents that are present in our lives, right? So this is what's interesting about him is that he sets it side by side in, the, in conflict. So in, in Don Carlos, you have this, a Marquis uh, uh, Rodrigo Poza, uh, who is really seems like a revolutionary, uh, a reformer, if you will. He doesn't seem to have any personal love interests or in, anything that he's after, uh, maybe except for political power. 
Um, but but he's presented as this uh, idealist reformer. And then uh, when it comes to Don Carlos, Don Carlos is preoccupied with uh, his personal infatuation with Elizabeth of Valois, who, whom he never really accepts as, as the wife of his father. Uh, and, and this is where the plot and the tension and all the intrigue comes in, is he is secretly in love with her and tries to make his uh, feelings known and, and runs into all, all sorts of um, oppositions and uh, demise. But really, it's, it's, the, it's this uh, blend of personal and political, right, that's a little bit interesting and a little bit new. And then how it develops and how the, the characters are presented in this development, that's what makes it interesting. On top of that, you have this new in, and somewhat uh, intriguing role of the Spanish church and inquisition in that. Uh, so we have this character, the grand uh, inquisitor, who famously appears later in Dostoevsky in Brothers Karamazov. And uh, he is presented as this final, the ultimate ruler, not even king can uh, contradict him. And then this really, um, in Schiller's portrayal, this really un underpins all the problems in, in, in Spain is that you have the the secular ruler bowing to the religious ruler and and you know and the, and the, and ultimately Philip is willing to sacrifice his own son to um to the demands of the inquisition so that's the that's the tragedy of it all and uh raises all sorts of all sorts of questions about personal loyalties versus uh state loyalty and of course in brothers karamazov uh dostoevsky further develops this idea of what's good for society versus what's good for maybe an individual and the church does the church have the right to decide what's good for society for everyone and this limits on you know the limits on freedom and so on. i mean all these things are so relevant to us now they're still relevant because we haven't really solved it solved these issues uh for all times for all people so anyway uh so these are some of the things that came to the forefront uh and then i'm, I'm curious uh what you thought was salient and uh, important and uh, interesting and what you thought was maybe uh, new that you haven't seen before and so on. So uh, with that, I wanna open the floor to, to anyone who wants to uh, contribute. If you guys, uh, I guess pref preference is given to those who have read the play, uh, obviously. Uh, and then if you haven't read it, then maybe if you have questions, you can we'll put those later. But first, if, if for those who have read it, uh, I'm curious what your or reread it, uh, what your impressions are and uh, what you would like to share with us. Uh, Joe, go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, just putting it into into perspective uh, with the previous plays that maybe we, we've covered as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think it's Philip's willingness uh, to do what, you know, what's best for the monarchy is probably the one theme that it kind of comes up, uh, this idea that the, uh, and I, it reminded me a little bit of Creon uh, doing what he thought was right in the sense that, you know, this is the way things have to be. And I'm, you know, willing to even sacrifice, you know, my own son due to that. Um, and so, and then you have this almost tyrannical kind of figure, uh, kind of, uh, in the same sense that the Creon almost was acting like, uh, and um, uh, and on the other end of it is, you know, somebody that has deeply held beliefs um, with uh, specifically a Marquise. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that's uh, just interesting uh, as as well. So I, I, I found that parallel to be um, uh, to be of a, a special interest. Um, the love triangle is kind of reminiscent of, of um, to a certain extent. Uh, uh, I would even say you could even make it. Well, no, let's back up from that. From the the idea of honor, I, I, I would say, as well, uh, and Othello, mm -hmm. but, but because I think this idea that you know Philip's, you know, idea that uh, you know his wife uh is being courted essentially and 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 that how that relates to um his reaction uh is to and and ultimately again his decision i think it's very not dissimilar to othello uh into how he reacts 
to uh, Desdemona's uh, um, uh, uh, seemingly betrayal, and even betrayal, uh, so that there's this this you know condemnation that, that this overreaction. Um, you know the the um, Princess Ebola as well as uh, you know it's her her actions as well as a, as a jealous lover. Um, I think is uh, is it, it's also another level of betrayal, and betrayal seems to be a theme throughout the play. Uh, and um, I think you know I'll leave my comments there, but I, I do want to come back to the friendship uh, between Marquise and Don Carlos at some point because I think that that's a really important point. I know I, you know that's not a great summary, but I do like the way you broke it up between the political and the uh, personal uh aspects of the play um so uh i think you can also yeah we can also explore a little bit with the um the uh absolutism mm -hmm. versus you know kind of this um this one way of thinking versus uh the ability to think freely um which is essentially uh, what Marquis represents. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that's a, an important point as well. Uh, so it's why it resonates with so many, I think, different people as a character that he represents, r resonates with so many different people. So anyway, this is just some scattered well, that's ideas. Great, Joe. Uh, thank you for this. You brought up all, all kinds of interesting uh, avenues. So I want to explore some of these is a kind of response to what you said. So I also was thinking of Otello, but I was thinking more along the lines of how different the uh, reaction, well, not maybe not the initial reaction of the king, but his eventual reaction was to Othello. And we know, I think we spoke about how Othello in some ways does come across a little bit naive. In other words, he doesn't seem to realize at all that people might have their own motives for saying certain things or for accusing another person. Whereas Philip, Initially, he comes across as this, like just a despotic uh, husband and king and so on. But he is much more complicated than that. He is not a, a simpleton at all. And he's also not a unsympathetic ruler, as we discover later. And so he realizes that the people that are advising him, uh, prim primarily Duke of Alba and um, Father Domingo, they might have an agenda of their own. And so he very cleverly challenges them to bring their accusations into the open and says that if you succeed, then you know you will have my trust. But if you do not, um, then you know it's your life on the line, which I, you know this is very <laughs> this is almost like Solomon's uh, judgment type uh, level, right? very, very wise to to challenge them to this and they and they withdraw uh, because they don't have uh, this um, confidence that they can well except for alba alba does say okay fine you know I'll, I'll i'll stake my life and my honor on this but then the king retorts back to him and says well you you you've always been ready to to risk your life for pretty much anything so so at this point we're risking the queen's life and your life and these are not in my eyes commensurate so uh no 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 sell <laughs> so there's some uh he's a very astute man and then he recognizes Marquis de Poza and you know makes him his minister. In response to Marquis's very flagrantly uh, kind of libertarian ideas, ideas of um, anti-clericalism. Well, not I, would, I don't want to say anti-clericalism, but maybe anti-absolutism for sure, right? And and he basically tells him that look, I I don't want to be at your court. I don't want to be your uh, servant, because if I am, I'm dependent on you, and that will tarnish my my independence, my ability to pursue my own goals, which is pretty <laughs> pretty um, extraordinary. Now, of course, this is Schiller's portrayal of him, uh, and and again, you know, that's why I wanted to, I started with the historical perspective on this. I mean, Schiller paints a painting that is not entirely accurate. But that's to be expected when you base your play on on historical um, uh, foundation. You, you you have certain liberty that you can take, but not uh, in some ways. That, that's another question I wanted to discuss. What you guys thought about how much liberty can you take? 
I mean, if you're completely remaking history and rewriting history and recasting characters to be, you know, uh, as positive or negative, good and evil, when, when in fact they were the opposite, are you in some ways, um, are you involved in, in something different than just art? Are you in fact uh, pushing some sort of idea? And, and to, to make it even more generic, is it ever possible to, to, to do justice to history when you put, you know, setting up a, a work of fiction like that? So that's a, that's a whole other uh, thorny issue. Uh, as far as the, the friendship of Marquise de Poza and Don Carlos, I always like to uh, look, go back to the beginning and look at the first interactions between these characters because they reveal pretty much everything that follows. So in, in the beginning of the book where Marquise um, meets Don Carlos after their, or, or reunites with him after their uh, some time apart, the way he introduces himself is very interesting. He says, I'm not your, uh, I'm not the friend of your childhood. I come to you as an ambassador of humanity, which <laughs> sounds pretty uh, um, uh, ambitious uh, and uh, uh, high-minded. If you uh, you know, uh, maybe a little bit proud, I would say, and uh, pretentious. Right, that's the word I was looking for. Pretentious, but that's how he sees himself. He sees himself as this uh, revolutionary, as a reformer, and he's willing to sacrifice everything else to this cause. This is super interesting to me because um, we had, uh, you know, my background specifically being from Russia and watching the kind of the socialist utopia play out as part of my, uh, you know, my uh, childhood and so on, and the, the, the ultimate, dis, um, ultimate demise of that utopia. Uh, kind of puts a different light on on Schiller because Schiller was very much uh, admired by the Soviet um, intelligentsia or the, the the bureaucrats and so on because he specifically was this idea uh, pr proposing these ideas of progress and struggle against the repressive reactionary classes and so on uh, and one of the ideas there is the fact that you can you have the right to sort of sacrifice everything personal to this cause, right? Uh, but the cause is supposedly for humanity. Humanity, part of which are you willing to sacrifice, you know, today for to, for tomorrow, right? So that's the that's the trade off you're making. Yeah, the, the means justify the ends, and um, we see it playing out here. We see that Marquis uh, betrays Don Carlos's confidence. He, you know, he betrays, the, uh, uh, presents the letters of Don Carlos. And all, and all he's doing is he wants to manipulate the situation to meet his own objectives. Now, his objectives are noble. His objectives are not for his own personal gain, presumably, but therefore the betterment of the Flemish republics, which will uh, be, um, he, he wants them you know, independent and free from Spanish influence. Which they, by the way, in history, historically, they they did achieve in that period. They were revolts, and they finally they achieved their independence from Spain. But in, in any case, um, the way he wants to achieve it is is by sacrificing Don Carlos and sacrificing himself. He's willing to sacrifice himself, but he's also willing to sacrifice others. And that's the um, that's what makes us so interesting, and so modern to us, because it's this idea of. Uh, you know, are we do we have a right to sacrifice other people for our, our visions of utopia or you know happiness at all costs? So that to me it was kind of the forefront as I was reading this. I'm curious if anyone else has any thoughts on this. Uh, if you do, uh, type in exclamation point and look forward to your ideas. And Joe, do you have any 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 comments on on what I just said or any? Uh, no, I mean, I think it, it's an important point uh, with uh, Carlos's vision of like this idealistic approach to the, you know, the, to society. Um, and uh, he's clearly, I think he's influenced by um, Marquise. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, with this idealistic vision of how the world is going to, you know, ought to work. And I, I do think that um, it's interesting that that you mentioned, and I didn't think about this, that Schiller would be actually celebrated by uh, by the Soviet Union because it, 
I get a much more libertarian then feeling to this uh, rather than a more of a socialistic. It's kind of like this freedom to think as you wish, as right. opposed to, you know, maybe the, the um, uh, you know, as a, it's kind of an opposition of the church and the totalitarian state versus a, um, uh, you know, versus a, say, uh, kind of well, a, let me, let me a put it this utopia. Way. He, was, he was very popular when you needed to destroy something old. He became less popular as the thing that displaced the old becomes the new norm. Right? So revolutionary ideas are always good when you're going against something, right? If you need to destroy some institution, Schiller is your friend because he will say uh, these institutions, the corruption that's embedded in them, the uh, the Moors, especially religious Moors, are was holding it all together. So we need to completely destroy and go beyond all of that and kind of hoist the the flag of freedom. And and by the way, these ideas are not Schiller's. These ideas are you know, coming from Rousseau and from the French Revolution. And so uh, they were not anything necessarily original. And I'm not saying, I'm not trying to denigrate Schiller. I think he was a, you know, he's a great writer and a great thinker and philosopher and a uh, uh, very sincere person in all of that. However, the way, it's one thing, the way you think, it's another way uh, or another aspect of it is how people use your thinking later on. And so his ideas, can become fuel for, for you know, de destruction, just like some of uh, Goethe's ideas or some of uh, uh, you know Wagner's uh, sort of emphasis on German nationalism can become fuel for destructive things, right? So we we know that it doesn't mean we need to throw out the, the baby with the bathwater. However, mm -hmm. I do have to say that based on Schiller's uh, contempt for absolutism, feudalism. Um, you know, this religious intolerance, right, bigotry, uh, in a large part, the Enlightenment thinkers and people that followed them did throw out the, the baby with the bathwater in the sense that they wanted to upend European um, civilization and kind of create something completely new. And we're, 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 we're having the same struggle today. We're trying to separate uh, the bad things from Western, you know, the bad heritage or the things that were not great about Western civilization from the Western civilization itself, right? Some of the good things that we, we currently have. So, and that's a challenge and it's a challenge, um, you know, post Schiller and, and going, going to today. Yeah, no, I mean, actually, I appreciate that you bringing it up that, and from that perspective, as far mm -hmm. as, yeah, you know, as far as um, upending the, the, power structure then yeah then from that perspective it makes a lot more sense uh yeah i was just thinking it, it, i mean the inquisition there was no question you know the inquisition was uh, a terrible terrible institution and that you know burned people at the stake even though there's some exaggeration right. of the numbers but still any number is, is 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 awful and if you remember in the beginning there is this um reference to auto da fe which is the act of faith, right? Which is what it's it's somebody it's a heretic being burnt at the stake, and he makes this proclamation before he's burnt that he repents, and based on his proclamation, hopefully they will burn him quickly, <laughs> as opposed to you know uh, burn him for a long time or something like that. And um, yeah, I mean it, it was terrible. Uh, the, all, all, you know, all the all the stuff that, that was happening there in, in Spain and. Um, at the time and in, in the um, Catholic Church in Europe in general. However, the opposite of that, which is, okay, well, let's just get rid of all of uh, Western uh, or, or Christian uh, tradition and throw all of that out, that was obviously an over uh, overplaying of that card, I think. My personal opinion now, some, some people will disagree, um, but uh, in my opinion, you need to be a little more careful about how the power structures that be use religion versus religion per se with its sort of uh, imb embedding of wisdom and tradition and a lot of human kind of values in it. But anyway, we're still working all of that out. So. Right. I agree. I mean, yeah, a whole lot of it with that. It's some of the same problems that existed back then, they're just, it's, it's somewhat mm -hmm. similar uh that we can yeah we can equate it to some of today's 
today's issues that we're actually dealing with. Um, yeah, um, even well, even the idea of doing away with a monarchy in a way. Uh, so. The, um, I, I do want to mention one thing, and again, guys, uh, I don't want to dominate the conversation. If you do want to contribute, just go ahead and type an exclamation point. Uh, it's fine if you just want to listen to it, it's fine. Um, so uh, one other, you know, Joe, you brought up Othello as an interesting comparison. Another interesting comparison to me is Shakespeare in general and Hamlet, right? Don Carlos is yeah. Hamlet-like figure uh, in, in, in a lot of ways. Uh, Hamlet also is betrayed. And Don Carlos feels betrayed by his father and, you know, betrayed in a, a way that perhaps is uh, out in the open, but still he feels betrayed and rejected by his father. That opens interesting um, topics for discussion about father-son relationships and this idea of how that is affected when you are, you know, the king and the enfant, right, the, the heir apparent. Uh, and that's a, in some ways, that's not an enviable place to be. If you if you if you want to have a good relationship with your dad, don't be born to a king. I think because right. uh, that's just there's so much conflict of interest there. I mean, which again, it seems historically speaking, the fathers always the kings always prefer uh, to do what's right for the state versus what's right for their relationship with their with their children. Right, the children always come last. But uh, I mean, there's no question, right? There's no contest. When when there was a choice between marrying who is to marry Elizabeth of Valois, even though his son was already betrothed to her. And and by the way, um, one qu uh, quick note on that, on the ages there. Uh, Don Carlos was 13 uh, when he was betrothed to Elizabeth. So when oh. this is taking place, this is like 10 years later. Uh, he is 23. But when he, he was actually betrothed was 13. And then two years later, when he was 15, his father takes his bride and, and marries her instead. So I don't know. I mean, maybe at 13, you have these, you know, the, the first love and all that uh, is really deep and uh, it's gonna uh, makes a scar and probably did. And that's the base, basis for this, uh, this tragedy. Uh, so that's just some historical overtones on this. But in reality, though, it seems that Elizabeth and, and, and Philip were quite happily married together, and she was a good uh, consort to him. And, and in the play, she's presented as a very admirable person, uh, a very honest, a very noble person. And uh, so that's, I think that's, that's a, I think Sheila did a good thing there. So he didn't in any way portray her as cruel or insensitive or anything like that. So she is quite quite admirable and even even princess of abelie who is portrayed as this intriguing um uh snake-like <laughs> uh spot yeah. and, 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 and and traitor she even she re recognizes the virtue of of the queen and and is conquered by it in some way and, and, and admits that she she is in the wrong here so she was. has a conscience and yeah, eventually she comes up um which uh, the, 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 I have to say for Schiller, though, he's a very uh, astute uh, psychologist in all of this. One of the things that he notes and through uh, the, the, um, uh, through the speech of Marquise de Posa is that Princess of Abeli, her seeming angelic nature and her seeming virtue, it's all based on favorable response from Don Carlos. As soon as that disappears, that virtue, that angelic nature, all of that is gone. But Don Carlos doesn't believe that. And, and, and in that sense, he is um, much more naive than Marquise. Uh, he's not as uh, uh, well acquainted <laughs> with, uh, with human nature, let's put it this way. Uh, but, the, uh, but Marquise sees right through it and he realizes that a princess, she is just... Uh, She's not really a good person to trust. So anyway, uh, that's another interesting uh, observation there. Uh, let's see. I think the, uh, um, the role of the Grand Inquisitor is actually also, uh, I think really kind of important as well to, to kind of dive into that is that um, in how uh he actually can 
forced the king yep. uh, to do to bend to his will, uh, essentially through you know saying yes, as you mentioned, being burned at the stake. Uh, and so I, I think that that's again, um, it's this uh, kind of authority figure that's outside the state that um, is kind of governing things. Uh, which is actually interesting in and of itself, because then you start to think about, you know, how the Pope used to, you know, kind of the popes could actually uh, govern without any necessarily uh, elect being a, not even elected, but being a, uh, a state official, so to speak, if that makes sense. Because I guess the Vatican would always be a state, but nonetheless. Um, yes, but but it, since I was just there, you know. Vatican, for all its uh, piety, is surrounded by this humongous uh, wall. So it's like a right. within, within a state. And of course, it's all kind of there's military all around it. So it relies quite heavily still to, even today on um, sort of the, the weapons of flesh and blood, let's put it this way, uh, not on, you know, the, the spiritual, <laughs> spiritual weapons only. Uh, Ernest, go ahead if, uh, if you have a question or a comment. Right. Let Joseph finish. He he makes a very good point about Grand Inquisitor. Uh, Joseph, you you want to continue? I'll just say that you know, in the sense that he he's uh, you know kind of forces the king towards tyranny uh, in a way. Um, so I think that that's uh, you know that's um, one of the uh, interesting points is that that it's it's this outside influence it's also making things impossible for for philip to even do the right thing um i don't you know the, as far as the significance to that uh you know i think that it's just more of a um way of kind of critiquing or criticizing the state i mean not the state the uh the church uh, in this particular instance, uh, and, and specifically absolutism, uh, that the king can't even do the right thing under, if he, even if he wanted to. Um, so I think that that's actually an interesting perspective is that, because um, that goes to plays to the theme of the freedom of thought, not even the king has a freedom of thought. Uh, and you have Marquise, and if you link it to that, Marquise is talking about freedom of thought from the people's perspective. Uh, so I think from, you know, it's interesting to see that you see this absolutism um, in different parts of the play, uh, you know, and, and how it can actually um, be so destructive in the sense that um, it's destructive to the point where Philip can't even think clear, uh, for himself, let alone the people think for themselves. Um, so I think that that, um, yeah, I think that that's, a, that's just a, it's a, another way um, uh, of talking about absolutism. Uh, Joseph, very good points. That's why I wanted to respond. Not only that, uh, I want to add that uh, he uh, reminds of Theresius, that he's blind and he uh, knows that past and the future, okay? He knows what Marquis was born about and what his uh, uh, plan to accomplish and stuff like that. So he represents uh, like a vision that he, same as Theresius. And that's why uh, Schiller made him blind, yes. Interesting, yeah, yeah I, I didn't pick that up that he was blind. I guess he, he was blind, right, the like Grand Visitor? That's what in my my translation. No, no I believe you. I just uh, I guess I I, uh, I didn't pay much attention to that part, but yeah, yeah, that's that's interesting. Yeah, um, yeah. One thing that I there were, you know, maybe we should read uh, some parts of 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 uh, the conversation between him and uh, the king, uh, if anybody can flip to that, because it, it's just so rich and there's so uh, a lot of really good points that are made along the way. I, I unfortunately I don't have the English translation. I was reading this and. In my Russian translation, but if you have an English translation, you want to flip to it towards the end. I think it's actually the very end, um, where they talk, and you know the final, the final uh, conversation is, or the final reply from the king is that you have basically you're you're free to do what you want with Don Carlos, which is to say 
he's going to be condemned to to be burned at the stake. In reality, of course, again, just just coming back to the historical again, none of this happened, right? Uh, what happened was Don Carlos became um, increasingly erratic and unpredictable and violent because of presumably because of his mental instability, and he was finally. And of course, at the same time, he was plotting against the king in Netherlands. But finally, he he, he was just jailed uh, and confined to a prison cell, and there he died. Uh, and then, after, and that became kind of the the source for uh, all kinds of. Um, uh, in fact, there was a tradition of denigrating sp Spanish culture and rituals uh, called the the Black Legend, and uh, this became prevalent in Europe, uh, especially during the conflict between England and Spain. And we have a kind of an echo of this conflict in the, in the demise of the Great Armada, right? The Grand Armada, which was defeated by the English in 1588. Uh, so uh, this conflict really created an atmosphere for anti-Spanish feeling in Europe. And, and this was picked up by Schiller later. Um, so this is where, this is kind of the, again, the, the stage for all, for all of this, which, Again, it's, there's so many interesting things you can do about this play, right? You can just read it and enjoy it. The, the plot on its face is very interesting on the surface, right? But then also at the same time, what you have is the political underpinnings, which come from Schiller. Let's not forget that Schiller is one of the uh, the romantic poets together with Goethe, and he's part of this Sturm und Drang uh, movement, right? The, the storm and the fury, the idea being that you're supposed to follow your emotion and be un more uninhibited and free and not be locked into some sort of tradition and all of this, uh, you know, uh, absolute um, authority of the monarchs and the church and the state and all the rest of it. Uh, so, and he's expressing, he's putting this all into the, um, the you know, he's playing it out through the through these characters, pr pr primarily through Marquis de Poza. He is his prime, uh, you know, protagonist, the revolutionary, right? And in some ways, a kind of a, a Lord Byron figure, I would say, right? I was thinking of Lord Byron as I was reading this. If you remember, Lord Byron uh, also dies in in uh, while he's participating in the war for independence in Greece. So he's another martyr, um, and uh, perhaps you know, uh, Schiller may, may, may have been inspired by him in in this um, in his uh, depiction. Uh, Shrikan, go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to talk about the point, the question that you raised about the relationship between the history and um, and these plays. Um, you know, great many authors have used history as, as a base, uh, whether it is Shakespeare, whether it is, you know, Schiller here, my favorite one is Hugo uh, on, on that. And, uh, you know, it's very interesting, you know, the, the question of, you know, role of history. The way I see it is that I, I agree with Aristotle that art at its best is higher than, than history. So I see all of them using history as a base and it provides a very rich base because it gives these ready-made concretes that they don't have to make up and then they add something. And at the greatest level for great plays, or great literature in general, they will add something very significant to it. So what it is, is not really, if they're trying to remain simply true to history, what they will produce is something quite, something that you wouldn't want to read actually. Uh, you know, it's, it's going to be quite, uh, it will have all kinds of accidental things and things like that. So, at its best, they, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of primarily looking at these as works of art. So as works of art, history seems, history just provides the background. And then what they do with it is based on their view of what human nature is. And really what is at trial and what is on trial and what is the greatest value that they have to offer is what they have to say about the human nature. So I'm always focused on, you know, this kind of triangles that are developed. Mm -hmm. Is that consistent with human nature? Is this saying something interesting? This rivalry between the sun trying to find a place 
in father's kingdom this mm. kind of you know the role of friendship the interaction uh, between between the political and personal and how they how they interact with one another and what you know the is the loyalty primarily to the political primarily to the personal both what is the relationship between a personal loyalty and people's differing loyalty in politics and then what happens to the personal in that context so those are the kinds of issues that i end up focusing on so i so to me like the historical details are not that important i'm just focused on the um what 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 the play or what the literature is trying to say about mm-hmm. human nature and if you go deep into it and this is true for every you know probably all of these things some are some a little bit removed some of them are quite a way, way removed from the historical accuracies because once you start once they start writing it as a play the requirements of the character themselves what they think is nature of certain kinds of character really take on its own uh, reality and they you know the, the plot is shaped by these so sometimes the plot will end up being very different what is going on inside the character will end up being quite different from the history that they base on but i you know because that because great literature can give you an understanding of human nature that just a raw study of history cannot do i think uh, i always look at these as works of art and i always evaluate them from the perspective of do they have something important to say uh, about uh, about human nature and have they done that well mm-hmm. so that's i just wanted to talk about what what you said said about the the history part mm-hmm. no no thank you thank you shikan that's a valuable um uh... point and i think i'm pretty much there with you uh for the most part i do have maybe a slightly different take on this just but just slightly i i don't think uh we disagree really uh because uh when so we have you know we we've seen two two types of plays uh ones that are purely sort of hypothetical right that are not based on anything in history so like uh you know mythological right based on mythology uh but then we have others that are his- based on some historical precedent some of them closer than others so we've seen lisid for instance in in a lot of ways lisid is very close to the historical um portrayal of of uh of don diego so uh or don rodrigo rather um so the um the uh the difference here though is that we have a little twist we have the historical and then we have the the portrayal that is somewhat divergent from it and when it is divergent that to me in itself is a very interesting thing because i want to know uh I, like i said uh, like uh, like you were saying shukan we want to understand human nature from these portrayals from the work of art so i want to know if there is a divergence in the display of let's say um don carlos uh, or or anyone else for that matter in the play is that an incidental divergence or is that a really a departure from what true human nature is like because we have a record right we have a record of the people that were there and how they were different or similar to what happened and to me that's a opportunity we have right that we don't have with all the other plays or a lot of plays that are not historically based and that that's what makes it interesting right like we have shakespeare you know julius caesar and we have cleopatra and we can you know in some ways we don't have a lot of information about them comparatively speaking but here we have quite a bit because it's much closer to us and so we have or or even like maybe with other plays like galileo right uh by bertolt brecht or somebody else like that we have much more information so we we can actually see the convergence or divergence and examine these from a um, variety of lenses right because i want to know what schiller was thinking but i also want to know how was it at that time how close was it to what was happening at that time and those are both really important questions i think because they are history is also a lens for us to learn human history from right just like art is it's it's almost like science and art history is more of a science in that sense art is more 
artistic and imaginative, right? We're, we're trying to imagine a world that matches our beliefs, like you said, our beliefs about human nature and what, what that is. Um, uh, Katie asked an interesting question about uh, why a German writer would be interested about Spanish history. Um, anyone else want to venture on that? I mean, I have, I have some thoughts, but anyone else wants, wants to reply to that? Uh, go ahead, Shrikant. Um Actually, it's quite common to see these patterns because some of these, uh, you know, almost all of these great writers are, you know, they realize that they have to understand human nature and they try to take in uh, the history of other countries uh, in order to, to you know, as, as a base. Uh, and in some ways it is actually more interesting to them because there is this difference between German and Spanish and French at the same time, it's kind of similar in some ways and difference in some ways. So as far as, as, a, as an exercise, not in trying to portray Spanish history, but to portray human nature, I think taking other cultures is a very powerful thing for, for an artist. And many, many, many artists, um, you know, do, do that. Uh, they, they are inspired by art from you know, artists from very different areas that speak different language, come from different cultures, and that's what makes their, their work uh, richer. So I, I think it is more of a rule for great artists, I would say, of kind of taking in both kind of as primary inspirations as well as uh, subject matter. So, I, so that, that's what I would say. Yeah, I have a feeling that um, that maybe I'm not sure that Schiller was specifically like super interested in Spanish history. I think he was interested in that incident of what happened, the historical underpinnings of that, because he had a thesis and he was looking for some sort of historical precedent for that thesis. Uh, thesis the thesis being kind of the struggle for um, freedom among the European nations and you know, uh, Germany, of course, uh, was sort of on the path to, re to reuniting and kind of ascending right in, Euro in European history. But it, it's been a, until that point, a, um, you know, there wasn't a single Germany, right? It was a, it were, it were all these smaller republics, German republics, they were somewhat independent and somewhat similar, I would say, to the, um, to the um, Flemish republics, right, in, in the Netherlands at the time. So there might have been some crossover there, some parallels there that Schiller was feeling very close to, uh, in 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 that sense that you know the Germans in their uh, I, I shouldn't even say Germans because it was Prussia, it was Austria, it was all these little you know the uh, all these little republics there in what we call Germany today. Same thing with Netherlands. Netherlands wasn't there. We had you had all all, all these different. Uh, townships and republics in the in the um, uh, in the territory that we currently call Netherlands and Belgium, and the Flemish republics, um, and so maybe he saw a parallel there. And uh, just like Germany had a very bloody history with uh, fighting for their own religious freedom against the Catholic Church and the Catholic um, France and and you know there were periods in history where there was that conflict and so maybe again that was very close to home for them uh, that or for him personally that you know he took the Spain as this uh, villain right uh, when we talked about the black legend right Sp Spain was considered the the archetype of the Catholic which still is right Catholic you know, Spain is a uh, very Catholic country today still. Uh, whereas Germany is is mostly uh, Protestant, um, or some of some of it is Catholic, I guess, but it's most mostly Protestant today, uh, and and there were some definitely conflicts there. So I'm thinking that maybe that had something to do with it. But I think mostly though, it, it again it was a theme that he was looking for a theme of freedom, of fighting for independence, of fighting for these um, political ends. At the same time, intertwined with a very interesting love triangle and you know relationship uh, uh, story that that takes place at the court so anyway maybe that was the the reason I don't know the precisely the answer then uh, Joe did you have a thought about that um no I mean it, it's interesting because I'm just thinking my own you, oh yeah 
Um, um, I'm just thinking uh, what you and Srikant, how you were exchanging ideas about what is trying to be communicated by the authors in general. And then I think if you go back to Greek tragedies, they're all, you know, per, you know, giving you a story about an underlying theme about the human condition. And specifically, like, uh, you know, you look at something like free will and uh, Oedipus Rex or something like that. Or even if you're looking at something that uh, even of um, uh, the idea of, you know, freedom uh, versus tyranny, uh, where you're taking these, these historical events uh, and then you're putting a story around them uh, that's entertaining to people. Uh, and this is a way of communicating ideas, uh, I think, more than anything else. Uh, one, it presents the idea itself, right? The the what what actually is, um, uh, you know, what actually may have occurred, like if it's a tragedy of some sort. Um, but also the possibilities too that exist, you know, that that the kind of an alternative, and so that can go either way, as you talked about a little bit earlier, right? It talks about tearing down, you know, Schiller could be seen as somebody as tearing down existing structures, right? So that that is an alternative, right? Now, whether that's a better alternative or not is, you know, kind of, we, we can we can have a discussion about that. But nonetheless, um, what it is, is it's communicating, you know, ideas that uh, of, um, uh, of how, uh, you know, we work as individuals, you know, and as how we function as individuals and how states function. Um, and, and then, uh, you know, from this, uh, I think from art, you can kind of start to see uh, concrete ideas start to emerge. Um, so, uh, you know, through stories, I think is an incredible way to communicate um, very powerful ideas. I mean, if you even go back to the Greek theater, uh, that was a way of uh, like kind of understanding what was going on to a certain degree uh, in society. Uh, so I, I, I still think that that holds true. And there's a reason why, you know, we, we talked about this in the past, Aristotle's forms of storytelling still hold true to a certain degree. Is it, you know, it's a way of communicating and resonating with people. Um, and I do think that these stories uh, really do um, you know, communicate ideas. And then uh, I was going to, I'll talk about the blindness a little bit later. Maybe that, that might be right. something to interest. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Ernest, go ahead. And then Shrika. Um, a very good question by Katie. You have to understand there was also censorship. You cannot uh, criticize uh, current government and stuff like that. And that's why he was uh, able to find a parallel in the history. Same happening with Shakespeare. All Shakespeare's plays takes place in Italy. So uh, censorship was a very important part, uh, especially when it touches subjects about religion. You, uh, you cannot uh, set it in present day Germany. That's why you, he has to, like Philip said, uh, find a parallel similar to what happened. Thank you. Thank you, Ernest. Go ahead, Shigan. So I, I really like uh, both uh, Ernest's point and Joe's points and your points. Um, so I want to say a couple of things. Um, so firstly, I find that all these artists are really well read. You know, they, are, they really have mastered the masters of the past, both philosophy and literature. Many of these people really know all of these things. And so all of history and all of literature is the input, the starting basis for these great artists. The second point is that, um, you know, for political reasons, uh, you know, and even for like giving you, you see, what they are trying to communicate is an idea. And I want to give you two, two very interesting examples of this. Um, really, some of them are very funny, but uh, some of them are really odd. Um, and one example is uh, Marriage of Figaro by Mozart. You know, he, it's based on French stuff. But what he's talking about is the hierarchy, you know, social hierarchies and how they play out. And he's able to bring that point in, in a way where nobody in the aristocracy can really object to it because it's like a funny thing and it is, 
but the point is very real. Uh, and my favorite example is that Ayn Rand, when she left Russia, she wrote, wrote a book called We the Living uh, about the struggle of individual against the state. And when Mussolini, uh, you know, he was looking for all kinds of propaganda and they said, oh, this is an anti-Russia book. So they, he actually let somebody make a movie of the book. And something very odd happened because no, really nobody wants to see propaganda movies. And they really, nobody, it used to be empty theaters, but suddenly they found that everybody was going and watching this film and everybody was loving it. And it took them some time to realize that it was the theme was not against Russia, but it was against individual versus the state. And it applied in spades to what he was doing. And that's why people were going and watching it. So they immediately shut it down and tried to burn all the, all the copies. Of it. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Srikan. <laughs> yeah, that was good. Um, I do want to bring up one, you know, just one little point that uh, I think I mentioned in passing, but I want to explore a little bit more. This idea that um, artists are not starting from scratch and that they're, I mean, Srikan mentioned this, that, you know, they're well read, but that doesn't mean that, of course, they always try to incorporate everything, which typically only very few artists can do that, uh, can incorporate multiple viewpoints into the same um, book. In fact, I, I, I mean, I, I, I can't think of like, I think Dostoevsky is a master of that because he can present multiple opposing viewpoints so well. He can articulate kind of like the steel man argument for each side very well. Very few other people can do that. And maybe you can't do that in a play because the, there's just not enough space or really it's not really built for that. But my point is that most artists uh, will try to not necessarily present a uh, entire spectrum of ideas, but they will present a specific viewpoint from which or standpoint from which they, they write. And that's valuable too, because you can't do a deep exploration of everything. You have to pick a, a side. And Schiller is interesting because we, we kind of know a lot about him. We know that he had a specific set of beliefs and they were influenced by, let's say, Rousseau. And Rousseau, of course, thought, we, we also know much about Rousseau. <laughs> so we know exactly uh, you know, the philosophy. And Rousseau famously said, uh, man is born free, but is everywhere in chains. And, you know, if you think from that standpoint that man is this free being, ide you know, this idealized free being, and, and yet he is in chains everywhere, well, you're going to have a very interesting, very specific, rather, viewpoint on history. Now, today, in modernity, I would say that we no longer think of man as this idealized free being. We know that man is, in fact, plagued by all sorts of things in a, in a free state of nature, which forces us to have a culture, which forces us to have these restrictions. That's where Freud comes in, that's where Jung comes in, that's where a lot of other thinkers come in. But at the time of Rousseau and at the time of Schiller, we really didn't really explore human nature to that degree. And, and it was presumed that, well, the only reason why we have corruption, the only reason why we have religion, the only reason why we have absolute authority is because it's just an evil. If we can just get rid of these evil uh, influences and go back to the pristine state of nature, we'll have this original paradise, you know, where, where, which we, for some reason, left, right? <laughs> so um, this is, to me, kind of the lens that I'm looking at, at this work uh, from, because I can see that philosophy being embodied and enunciated in so many different ways both as it's building the characters in the play, right? The King Philip character, uh, the Grand Inquisitor character, the uh, Duke of Alba character, who are portrayed in a somewhat sinister light. I mean, they are not very complimentary characters uh, um, in a sense that they're not very virtuous. They're not presented as terribly virtuous. They are all sort of like painted with a black brush. But in reality, them. It, things are much more complicated than that. And, and that's where the Grand Inquisitor perhaps is this pivotal character that he has a, a truth of his own. He has a viewpoint of his own. His, his point is that 
you know, if you let things just develop and everybody run with their own happy ideas, you're going to have this anarchy, which is ultimately going to be even worse than the current oppression or what you think is oppression. And um, that um, is a viewpoint, whether you agree with it or not, it is a, a valid observation because we know from, again, from history and from study of anthropologies and so on, that people don't really behave very well to, uh, with one another if there are no limits placed in their behavior. So uh, that, I think, is an important lens and an important thing to realize, the underpinnings of Schiller, the underpinnings of his philosophy, the fact that Rousseau was you know, huge influence and the fact that it wasn't really developed at that point, I think you, you kind of have to take it into account. You can't just take it on, on face value that, you know, these characters are kind of stand on their own feet. They express a particular set of ideologies. Uh, Joe, go ahead. Yeah, you know, I was just thinking actually, um, uh, the, the, there's like, you know, there's a lot, that, and I'm, there's a third, example that I had, but anyway, the one example that I was just thinking about um, is that, you know, writers are trying to talk about, I think, in the sense of um, duty and loyalty, uh, and, and you can see it across all, um, kind of in a way, all the plays that we covered thus far, um, but in particular with Antigone, I'm starting to think that it, it, in particular, um, that she thought she had a duty to her brother, right? Um, if you think of the Grand Inquisitor um, and or Philip or even uh, Duke of Alba, uh, they all had a sense of duty um, that that you know that they they felt was uh, they had to carry out uh, in order to you know. And this is the perspective that you start to 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 put together in a storyline. And the reason why I say that that's important is that when you're writing a story, you can start to think about themes that you wanna communicate with each character. Um, and then you can kind of develop the characters from there. Uh, and I think that that's, um, that's one way of writing. This is also another way of communicating very deep philosophical concepts uh, is to say, you know, this is what happens when you only look at it from this perspective uh, and not necessarily take the perspective of another. Um, and I think that that's when you're talking about storytelling in particular, um, he, that's where you, you can take a, a theme like duty and actually run with it. And I think that that's, that's an interesting thing is, um, uh, or even, uh, uh, you know, and I think, like a uh, friendship, loyalties, loyalty to the state, loyalty, you know, all these things, you can kind of start to form ideas and plays and tell a story that actually starts to be of interest. Anyway, that was a lot of rambling. Anyway, that, I was just thinking of duty throughout these plays that we've covered. No, that, that, that's great, Joe. I mean, because I think it ties back to Le Cid, right? That's where we started exploring this idea of limits of duty. And Le Cid, in a beautiful way, illustrates that at some point you can't say no to human nature and and like you know the the love that um uh, we have for other people in some ways it's part of our nature it's part of our hum human humanity what makes us human we can't just turn that off uh in this play it's a little bit more profound i think because it brings up other other considerations so one of the you know one of the considerations that Marquise and uh the poser brings to Don Carlos says, why are you infatuated with your own personal happiness? Why do you forget the happiness of other people? You're not just a private individual, you're an heir to the throne. You need to think about other people and all you do is think about yourself and your crazy love affair or what, you know, and, and he has a point. <laughs> uh, again, I'm just trying to enunciate his position, which to me, you know, it seems reasonable, right? If you put it in those terms, but what, what becomes unreasonable, and this is where, again, to me, it, it, starts on a on a on a dark path is where he himself where he's opposed it takes another person's happiness and places it on this altar and makes it a sacrifice of don carlos in his own life for this cause this is where you know this is the 
uh, hell is paved with good intentions road, right? Uh, because the, the future is uncertain, but what is certain is that you're going to die and you're going to kill other people with you. Uh, so this is kind of the what we should really be afraid of, uh, just like Aristotle's saying that there is no such thing as evil. Uh, it, it's just deformed good. That should scare the hell out of us, because if that's true, then any good intention, any good plan, you know, we know how how bad it can go, right? We know how, uh, because if there's no evil, whatever evil things that we think of today, that's actually just good that's deformed. So <laughs> that should be a wake-up call that, um, you know, we should be careful about good intentions. But my point being primarily is that Deposa and uh, his, his zeal for the happiness of humanity is all too ready to sacrifice another person, a friend, his life, for this cause, and that's that's really where it becomes uh, a matter of debate, I guess. Do you agree or disagree that it's a valid thing to do? I mean, if we're if we're in a boat and one person is sinking this boat, maybe we should throw that other person overboard. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but are we justified in doing the same thing if they're just sitting quietly <laughs> and uh, you know sacrificing uh, for the common good? So. Anyway, I'm curious what you what you guys think about that. I mean, I, I very think valid I, poll. Go ahead, go ahead, Ernest. Go ahead, Ernest. Very valid poll, uh, point of Philippines. This is why it's very important uh, uh, in the Act Three last scene when this conversation takes place with uh, Marquis de Posa with uh, King Philip. That the, the argument uh, on each side. And one very valid point he makes, and let me try if I can uh, uh, read mm -hmm. very important point that is an uh, eternal point. Uh, it says, the world is growing younger day by day, and you alone in Europe fling yourself into the path of the great world fate's will that runs unstoppably at full speed on. To jam its spokes with your sin human arm, you will not. Many thousands have already fled from your kingdoms, poor but overjoyed. And that's eternal words. When you have a dictatorship, people run away from you. And it's incredible that it still continues on. As we know, in the Russian Federation last year, more than 700,000 people left the country. Uh, even so, they are poor, but still they are overjoyed to not to be part of the Russian Federation. Yep. Yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly what we're talking about here. Um, we have a very, you know, absolutist the example of an absolutist ruler right now before our eyes and how it's all playing out. Um, not sure, though, in some ways, I mean, Putin is not Philip of Spain, unfortunately. <laughs> so I think Philip of Spain had much more regard for his own people than, than Putin does for the Russian people and anyone else for that matter. But, um, but still, the point holds that if you develop this culture of absolutist um, rulership, then by definition, you will only have people that are insincere and are essentially psycho, uh, psychophants right at, at uh, near you, which is, by the way, that, that is true for all dictators. And it's definitely true for the Russian dictatorship today. Because that, that's, that's the problem why they, they, they have such bad information all the time is because they're, yeah, you know, you have a person that's surrounded by yes men uh, who cannot tell the truth. But uh, that's good for us. That's good for kind of the free world. But anyway, um, but it's true. It was true for, for Philip II, most likely, that if he uh, had this type of rulership. And again, I'm not sure that Schiller is correct in that he did. I think he, it was much more nuanced than that. Uh, he did have good people uh, uh, next to him. And, and Duke of Alba, you know, was not just a psychophant. He was an actually a very able uh, a ruthless person, but a very able person for sure. Um, so anyway, there's again, there's, it's a very interesting uh, argument there that could be made uh, on, on both sides. Uh, 
Joe, did you have something else to say? I actually did, but now it went in and out of my head. <laughs> you, you're saying something so about it's blindness? Like, oh, the blindness of the Grand Inquisitor? Yes, uh, uh, I was thinking about that. Um, in terms of uh, uh, one of the great, maybe it is Oedipus. I, I forgot. I, I, it was something. I, I, it lost, I went in and out of my uh, head as actually as I was thinking there. So sorry, I need to, to write down my thoughts sometimes. Um, I want to read um, from this um, exchange between um, the Grand Inquisitor and the King, uh, if you will allow me, uh, because I think it, there's just so much there and it's, uh, quite deep and uh, you know instead of talking about it we can just read some of it and then we can discuss so I can find this real quick right so one of the things that they start talking about is this idea that you know the Grand Inquisitor tells the king why why did you murder Marquis de Poza he was supposed to have been a, a sacrifice for us right he's you know we should have gotten our hands on him and instead you just murdered him. That was too uh, lenient a punishment for for an, for a criminal like him, and uh, so this is the uh, the context of that of this conversation. But then it goes goes further. So let me just read uh, one second. Uh, this rebuke. Uh, so the Grand Inquisitor says, "This rebuke, I, I pay you back. Why did you not consult us before you sought the arms of such a man? You knew him. One sole glance unmasked him to you." Why did you rob the office of its victim? And we thus trifled, and, and are we thus trifled with? When majesty can stoop to such concealment and in secret behind our backs, league with our enemies, what must our fate be then? If one be spared, what plea can justify the fate of thousands? So the, the, I guess the one that is spared is, is, the, uh, is Marquis, because he, his murder again spares him from a much harsher punishment. Uh, King replies, but he no less has fallen a sacrifice. Grand Inquisitor, no, he's murdered, basely foully murdered. The blood that should so gloriously have flowed to honor us has stained the assassin's hand. What claim had you to touch our sacred rights? He but existed by our hands to perish. So this whole idea of the church becoming the uh, uh, executor of justice, right? Not just the judicial branch, but every branch possible, right? The, the judicial, the legislative, and the executioner. That's what's really scary in this scenario that Schiller paints for us. Whether or not it was actually, again, I, I always have to um, say, it, whether or not it was actually true, I guess, to Shrikant's point, it is a danger where you have um, uh, an agency in society that determines the truth, the ultimate truth of everything, and has the power to punish and determine what the punishment should be, uh, that is truly uh, scary. And it was, you know, it was to a degree that in um, 16th century Spain. So uh, just just these these uh, replies from the Grand Inquisitor, they're quite chilling uh, um, as, as Schiller presents them. Let me, uh, let me read a few more. Um, it's also the rational part of it, like how they are actually rationalizing their actions as well. That's that's actually the one of the interesting points is that you know um, that this is a you know this is the ends justifies the means kind of perspective uh, that's actually so destructive. Um, ultimately, when you you're starting to see it, and it, and it comes out. Uh, I think anytime you're talking about uh, a, a tyrannical or dogmatic belief system, mm -hmm. um, because the system becomes more important than the the principles. Uh, so then somebody's principles. Uh, so that that yes, then sacrificing uh, um, uh, your your you know personal. Um, belief system as is, is is completely okay uh, so i think that that's a um 
yeah, it's it's the it's the rational way of thinking that you, you think you're doing the best thing. And it's kind of like where you talked about Aristotle talking about uh, that there is no evil. You know, and there's this privation of it, so to speak. Um, that's also the same perspective that Socrates would take is that nobody does harm intentionally, that everybody's acting in their own personal self-interest. Uh, and that they think that they're what they're doing is the right thing to do. Um, and uh, with that perspective, uh, you know, that that um, then you start to see where uh, a, a rigid belief system kind of goes afoul uh, because, you know, then you're outsourcing any kind of real reason, any kind of real logic uh, that you have um, to, you know, to, in this case, the church. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me read a few more lines. This is where uh, the Inquisitor asks Philip how it was, how it happened that he got ensnared by Marquis de Posa and his dang dangerous ideas. So listen to this. Um, no, uh, this is the Grand Inquisitor. No, I'm ill, uh, I'm ill pleased with you to see you thus tarnish the bygone glories of your reign. Where is that Philip whose unchanging soul fixed as the polar star in heaven above round its own axis still pursued its course? Is all the memory of preceding years forever gone? And did the world become new molded when you stretched your hand to him? Was poison no more poison? Did distinction between good and evil, truth and falsehood vanish? What then is resolution? What is firmness? What is the faith of man if one weak, unguarded hour, the rules of threescore years dissolve in air like woman's fickle favor? The king, I looked into his eyes. Oh, pardon me this weak relapse into mortality. The world has one less access to your heart. Your eyes are sunk in night. Grand Inquisitor, what did this man want with you? What new thing could he adduce you did not know before? And are you versed so ill with fanatics and innovators? Does the reformer's vaunting language sound so novel to your ears? If the firm edifice of your conviction totters to mere words, should you not shudder to subscribe the fate of many thousand poor deluded souls who mount the flaming pile for nothing worse. King, I sought a human being. Grand Inquisitor, how? Human beings? What are they to you? Ciphers to count with all, no more. Uh, in another tra translation it says, numbers. What are human beings to you? Numbers, no more. I thought this was really, really good. Um, that the, uh, the church accuses the king of treating human beings as numbers, meaning all you care about is kind of how much, you know, how many troops you command and so on. You don't care about individuals. You just care about kind of the end result. Uh, whereas I think in, the, uh, in some ways, this was kind of the, uh, the pot calling the kettle black. I mean, the church probably cared about the numbers of parishioners uh, no less than the kings counted the number of their subjects. But it's a good point, nonetheless, that in both cases, you're sacrificing individual human beings to the cause, and you really don't care to know them personally, which is what, I guess, the error was in, in Philip's uh, behavior that they're discussing, is that he, for a second, became a human being, and for a second, he uh, acquiesced to his um, humanity. And that weakness, which he calls weakness, uh, is what led him to embrace Marquis de Posa and be kind of ensnared by his youthful enthusiasm. Um, anyway, that's that's all I have for for the reading. Uh, I don't know if anybody else has any thoughts on on this. But that that is very interesting in the sense that you kind of like have this humanistic values um, uh, being embodied by Philip. And the one thing that comes to mind was. Um, Stalin, you know, the idea that one person's a tragedy, 20 million is, or is a statistic, right? And, um, right, 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 right. You know, you know it, it, it's becoming like almost that. Yep, um, that's exactly the point I was making. It, yeah, it's it's the same point that's, that, that, that is being made. But I also think that there's this, um, you know, there's this idea that maybe the people might be right. Maybe the collective wisdom of the people might be right and not necessarily the totalitarian approach that the church is taking. Um, you know, that that's kind of where the democratic values kind of come in. 
uh, where you know Philip is starting to at least question himself and saying, you know, maybe maybe I am wrong about this. And the Grand Inquisitor is like, no, you're okay as long as you know you're uh, maintaining, you know, don't necessarily even worry about the number of people that you have underneath you or, or following. It's it just worry about um, maintaining your power for the greater good. Uh, and I think that that's a, that's kind of gets to the whole theme of, 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 of the play itself. Yeah, the thing that uh, I'm a little bit less uh, optimistic about, maybe, <laughs> maybe it's part of our current situation is that, uh, you know, when you say democratic ideals and so on, um, yes, but the church actually molded the public opinion, just like, you know, you have powers today that mold public right that's a good and, point uh so the democratic ideals quote are actually given from above so in a sense you you kind of have a circle right? you start from from the top and the ideals circle down and so you kind of select your own cage right you pick the right cage that, that people want you to be in uh of course it's not called a cage it's called glorious freedom or whatever but uh still you know that's that's the um how it functions because the church to a large degree controlled public opinion of that time, right? How how did people, people came to these audit affairs not to protest, but to uh, support. And, and it was, a, you know, it was just like the Gladiator Games, right? It was a notable, uh, what do we have today? Oh, we have the audit affairs, uh, let's go. Let's have some, you know, bake some barbecue and watch an audit affair. Um, so uh, why did they do that? Well, because the sermon Sunday before they heard a sermon that talked about the heretics and talked about all the all the, the rest of the dogma. So point being is that it's it's all too easy, unfortunately, to manipulate the public um, into supporting these very things that are called autocratic. Um, that's where it becomes a little more complicated. Yeah, it is a double-edged sword. I, I agree with that. Uh, that's my pessimistic take for tonight. That's it. I'm not going to say anything more pessimistic. <laughs> it's fair. It, no, it's a fair, fair critique. All right. Um, anyone else have any thoughts on Don Carlos um, as we wrap up here? No, no rush. Just um, if you have any um, additional ideas you want to contribute, any questions, any... I do have a question, actually. Go ahead. Um, yeah. I, I haven't read the uh, Brothers Casmaro. Uh, um, mm -hmm. What's the relationship between uh, uh, the Grand Inquisitor in that particular? <laughs> uh, well, it's the question. It's it's, it's the question. Um, you know, they talk about uh, re rebelling against God, and um, you know that's that's the really the the kind of the the main point of that conversation between. Um, the younger brother, who is a very religious person, and I uh, forget the older brother's name. Is it Ivan? Ivan, uh, yeah. Yeah, Ivan, Ivan Karamazov. So, um, and Ivan basically, you know, describes this hypothetical situation that, um, base that essentially the point of that is that the if God exists. Uh, he's not just by any, by any means of, I mean, he has, he has two points. One is about the, 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 the cruelty in the world. And there's that story about the little girl being uh, killed by, um, by these dogs. And it's meant to sort of uh, elus or underline the fact that the world as it is, is, is absolutely unjust. And, and, and not only is it unjust, no amount of heavenly par paradise or any kind of uh, Edenic, um, happiness will ever wipe away the tear of that little child that's his point it's still not just no matter how much happiness you pile on at the end you know that's the the big christian idea is that well the injustice of today is okay because you're going to have justice and final recompense tomorrow but karamazov's point is no that's not how that works uh, at least in his mind it doesn't work like that you cannot ever get rid of that injustice that takes place but the second part is about the church and religion as a touch of society. And then he brings up the Grand Inquisitor and he says that in fact, religion is not a force for, um, for uh, liberating you. It's in fact a force for holding society together. 
And if Jesus came again, uh, as he did the very first time, he would again be crucified by, this time, by the uh, the, the Catholic Church. The Grand Inquisitor in that uh, remark is, is comes to visit Jesus at, when he comes back, hypothetically, for the second time. He comes back still the same way, incognito. Um, he's just healing and doing all these things for people. And the second time, again, he's caught, he's put in prison, and they're going to crucify him again. But this time, it's the Christian church that's going to do it, the Catholic church. And the whole point is that the church and, in general, society does not need these revolutionary ideas, that they are untenable, that they, in fact, are going to always end up in the same place, which is the, the, the place of inquisition, the place of um, torture and so on. Uh, so those are the two main points. Now, whether now Alyosha, the, uh, the younger brother, he doesn't agree with any of that. He believes that, uh, that God and, 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 and the way God transforms an individual is what answers all of this. And the, the liberation comes from within. Great idea, noble idea. Okay, I mean, we know whether or not we believe that as a, on a again, on a great, great scale, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe individually that helps. But I don't think it works in a, in a kind of societal complex. So that's that's why Ivan Ivan Karamazov's point about the church and religion in general is, I think, still valid to, to a large degree. It's there. It's needed because society cannot function on this sort of an, uh, anarchist basis, not for very long. I mean, it's a good idea, but it just doesn't work. And so therefore we need, because most people are not going to think for themselves. And most people are not going to uh, take the responsibility you need to take as a free individual, at least not at great scale. And so you need these binding things that uh, sort of hurt us into these big silos. And the tragedy of our life is the fact that we we acquiesce to that and we end up in this sort of situation where we have to crucify Christ. Otherwise it's it's chaos. So anyway, a lot of, that, that, that's a cool Thank you for that. Uh, discussion there that we can talk for hours. <laughs> you know, it's, I appreciate that. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, it's one of those books I've never read, and and so well, maybe I, we should put it on a reading list. It's a great, uh, it's a tremendous, uh, tremendous work of of philosophy and everything else. If you'd be willing to do that, I would definitely yes. go through it. Yeah, Shrikan, talk to Shrikan. We'll we'll add it to our list. <laughs> uh, Ernest, you're you're uh, muted. Uh, you were saying something. Shrikan, also. Awesome. Oh, Oh, maybe he's just talking to somebody else. I don't know. Uh, Phil, can I go next? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you a question. And then if anybody else wants to chime in on this, you know, this is a series of plays and we are now, we finished four. So what is it like for you to go through plays where we are doing a different play every two weeks or so? Um, what is what is the real reaction to this entire series as a whole? So, uh, oh Phil, I would like to I'll like I'll you to like go first, and then any, anybody mm -hmm. else who wants to chime in, I uh, would love love to hear from it uh, from from uh, anybody who wants to chime in. Go ahead, Phil. Yeah, I like I like you know that there's certain advantage to to them being self-contained, and I feel like we, what we're getting is a uh, you know each one is like a bead in a necklace, you know, or a bracelet. And you get this beautiful combination. After a while, they all start interplaying with each other. And uh, you know, Joe already did a lot of, the, of these comparisons with, and Ernest did uh, some, some too today with some of the uh, earlier plays that we've uh, covered: the Antigone, and um, uh, Othello, and Lacid. And so you know, it's already becoming a very uh, interesting conversation. So each play to me is like a dial. You know, we have a dialogue. And you have multiple people participating in this dialogue. And that's the advantage of it, is, is that you have multiple voices from multiple time periods, and they're all giving a little bit of a different viewpoint, different take. And once we get them all together, then it becomes kind of this, hopefully, it becomes this beautiful panoply of, of themes and meanings that can interplay and give us maybe a, a, a much more multidimensional view of you know, humanity as a whole of art, aesthetics. I mean, all these plays are beautiful in their own ways. They're limited in their own ways. They are interesting. And maybe it's, uh, it's, it's a really kind of a good 
combination when you put them all together. None of them is perfect by themselves, right, uh, by itself, but together they form this very interesting interplay, a panoply of, of meaning. Uh, I think we have Joe. Joe, go ahead. Uh, folks would love to hear from anybody else as well. Joe, go ahead. I think this is actually a really, this is, um, this is a fun series. I was a week off like with my timing. Uh, so I was listening to this like uh, the last second there, but the, but the, but the um, overall, I, I enjoy plays much more uh, than I do um, anything else because it's actually, it's a lot of fun. Uh, you know, there, there's a story behind it. There is, there are deeper philosophical concepts that we can uh, talk about. Um, uh, the idea of storytelling in general, I think is really, it's an important skill to have. Um, and it's starting, uh, I, I like this series. Um, also seeing the themes between the plays that have been selected has been a lot of fun uh, in, my, in, my, in my opinion. Uh, so I think, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, I think this series is um, uh, something that it, we could continue. I think they're also, you know, they're only, they're not really long. Um, so that's also kind of makes it accessible for everybody, uh, to, you know, uh, to participate whenever they, they can. Um, the other, uh, I mean, I, I will say I like this series, um, as much as any, uh, outside of Dante, um, Dante, I like the, the best. Uh, and I know that that was a long detailed journey. Um, so that was, that was, yeah, that was the only thing I liked better. But um, yeah, that's that's my thought. I think that this is a great series and it's accessible and, and yeah, and you can get as many, you know, you can get a lot of different people involved. So anyway, those are my thoughts. Right, uh, does anybody else want, want to comment on, the, on these plays? What it's like going through these plays? All right, I mean, I, I also like this series a lot. Uh, because I, I just like, uh, as Joe was saying, as Phil was saying, it's like um, so many different perspectives and all of these are giants and all of these plays are just amazing. So putting them side by side and you know, integrating them has, has been just, uh, just amazing. So, and Phil, thank you. Thank you for putting, you know, for, for doing all of this. Uh, I think, uh, all the literature stuff we have done, plus all the language stuff that you have you put on the table has really been been uh, very, very special. Great. <laughs> yeah, so thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Philip. I'm looking forward in two weeks to NMA of the state. Yes, yes, that's what we're reading next. Um, so yeah, we'll see you guys. Uh, um, sure, sure. Uh, just a quick uh, intro to Enemy of the State. Uh, it's it's a change of gear because uh, Ibsen is very much you know it's closer to modern modern times, and the issue is also very close to modern times, and it's um, really really powerful a powerful play. The style is very different. This is, um, you know, from Northern Europe, um, and this is it's, it, it's just it's just wonderful, wonderful play. Ibsen. If you have not read Ibsen before, you are in for for a treat. So see you in two weeks with Ibsen. Uh, Phil, I'll give you the last words. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, see you guys in two weeks. I look forward to another stimulating discussion, and uh, thanks for participating. <laughs>